Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining this webinar hosted by Positive Money Europe and the Sustainable Finance Lab. My name is Stanislav Jordan. Um, I am the Executive Director of Positive Money Europe. Um, I'm just going to say a few words to introduce this webinar before um, I will hand, the, hand over to Claire Jones for moderating the introduction and, 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 the, and the debate. Um, so just in a few words, and I just have got two slides to share very quickly. Two words about the context um, for this webinar. Uh, so I'm sure most of you have seen the invitation and, and the context behind it, but basically we've just released a new paper um, uh, together with Sustainable Finance Lab um, on the idea of a green, greening the TLTRO program of the ECB. I'm gonna leave the details to be explained later on. Um, so, and also just to explain, so we at Pusimony Europe, we are a nonprofit organization. We're based in Brussels and our mission is to uh, ensure that the European Central Bank um, is contributing to a fair, democratic and sustainable economy. Um, so when, what we mean by that, I mean, a few, a few months ago, um, if I can share this slide, yeah. A few months ago, um, as I'm sure you know, in January, the European Central Bank has announced the launch of a strategic review, uh, which is supposed to revamp how the ECB fulfills its mandate. And as part of that, um, uh, the ECB made it clear, the ECB president made it clear that climate change will be considered as, as in terms of what the ECB can do to support the EU's um, actions against climate change. Um, and we, together with those NGOs, we identify five areas uh, in which the ECB could uh, support the EU's objective for climate change and the Paris Agreement. And today, the paper that we, are, we have released two, week, two, month, two weeks ago present one of those areas, uh, namely the Green TLCRO Refinancing Operations Program. But it, so this is just to say, this is just one of the several areas in which we are active, in which support, we are supporting other measures uh, but today we're just going to zoom in into one. This proposal that uh, we're presenting um, stems from the idea that we had a few months ago that as part of everything the ECB does, a lot of attention has been put to quantitative easing programs, the asset purchase, but it seemed like the, the, the TLTRO program became an increasingly important tool as well. So since we released this paper, it's been quite successful. We're very proud that the ECP president, uh, Madame Lagarde, has already um, endorsed that at least there should be a, a, a debate on this, on this proposal. She said in the European Parliament two weeks ago that the Green Theater is a matter of interest and that the ECB will look into it. We also mentioned um, several times by, by Isabel Schnabel from the ECB's board. And just this morning, there was also an article in Bloomberg mentioning the the debate around uh, the proposal inside the central bank community in Europe. Um, so I'm not going to dwell further into the debate uh, because that's, this is why we've got a fantastic panelists with us today. Um, and I'm just going to wish you a very uh, interesting debate and very free. I hope you, we will learn a lot about the proposal and, and also that we will learn a lot about how, how this can be uh, further improved in terms of how we, we define further the proposal. Um, and um, just to remind, this is also a proposal that has been, we have carried out with the Sustainable Finance Lab. It's a Dutch think tank that is also doing great work on green finance and other topics. And we're very proud that we partner with them on that project. Thank you all very much for attending this webinar. Thank you all for the panelists and also especially for the ECB also to, for, for being present uh, with us today. And thank you all for all the great attendees we have um, in the audience. And I now hand over to, to Claire. Thanks a lot, Stan. And thank you to all the participants for joining us for today's uh, webinar. We want to make it as interactive as possible. So please pose questions on the Zoom channel and we'll come back to them later. Um, I also want to mention just briefly here that this session is being recorded and it will be made available on the Positive Money website afterwards. Um, so, just to begin with, let's, let, let, let's take a step back. I've been writing about central banks since 2007 and until the past few years, I don't think this issue was on the agenda really at all. Um, but 
what you've really noticed recently is both on the regulatory side and on the monetary policy side, it's really taken off as a topic. You've had Mark Carney in the UK who's been a very um, strong advocate of the, the greening of the work that central banks do. And then I think with Christine Lagarde coming to the ECB, you've seen it really move a lot more into the focus of the central bank here too. Um, however, um, I think there's a lot of will to do things to do things to, to, to green monetary policy and to green regulatory policy. Um, the difficulty can often lie in the implementation. And I think that's why papers such as the one that we're talking about here today are really welcome because there's a lot of tricky issues here with introducing policies and then those policies creating perverse incentives. So we really need the sort of panel that we've got today to really try and give some careful consideration to those issues and really get beyond that and come up with the sorts of policies that are really going to enable central banks not only to green what they do but to avoid um, attention that they're overstepping their mandates or creating the sort of incentives that you don't want to see. So without further ado I'd just like to say I'm delighted with the three speakers that we've got here today. I'm really confident that they're going to be able to give us an awful lot of insight into how to move the debate forward on, on green and monetary policy and specifically the view of how to green the Teltros, which have been a, a, you know, a tremendously important part of the, the ECB's the crisis fighting armory. So first of all, I'd like to introduce from Pictate Wealth Management, Frederick Ducrozet, who's ECB Watch and Supremo. Hi, Frederick. Hi, Claire. And then from the ECB, I'm delighted to welcome Isabel Van Steenkis, who's the Deputy Director for Monetary Policy. Thanks a lot for taking the time to be on the call today, Isabel. And <laughs> last but not least, we've got Jens Van Tlukluster, who's, who's one of the co-authors of the report. So I think it would be good if we began with Jens. So over to you, Jens. Yeah. Thanks, uh, Claire, and uh, thanks also to my uh, fellow panelists, indeed, for, for helping me with um, uh, thinking about the topic of how to green monetary policy operation. So as uh, Stan uh, already mentioned, uh, we've been thinking about this topic for some while. And then over the summer uh, with Rens van Tilburg, we wrote up this really detailed proposal of how to, how to actually green uh, ECB refinancing operations. And um, well, the, the, the story I have today is on the one hand, very simple, right? The idea of green TLTROs is, is by itself quite simple. Banks get cheap ECB credit as they currently already do, uh, but in this case, only if they issue green loans. Now, I'm going to zoom in on two, I think, absolutely key issues. So first, is the ECB allowed to do this? Uh, and as I'll explain, I think green TLTO program really falls within the ECB mandate. And there are even good reasons to think that it does much better at achieving the ECB mandate than the existing TLTRO programs. And then there are these operational challenges. And there, I think, on the one hand, it's, it's really something that the ECB could just start doing today. Um, in a uh, at least a pilot ver form, but I also think this program will just become way more powerful over time, and that's that's maybe one of the really most promising aspects of it. Okay, so first, green. What counts as as a green loan? Why should the ECB be doing this program now? I think. The uh, key developments in that regard, on the one hand, the, uh, the pandemic, massive damage to the EU's uh, economy, a recovery that need to, will need to take place. On the other hand, just this summer, the ECB, the, the EU completed the first uh, taxonomy regulation, the green taxonomy, um, which provides an answer to what counts as a green loan. That is not just something that's a private certif certificate uh, claims, but that really has an immensely detailed uh, 
expert-based vision of where the EU should be going um, in environmental topics behind it. So the Green Taxonomy started off as a guide really for, for investors, ENG investors, spelling out what kinds of investment count as properly green. And in that sense, sort of helping green investors navigating a lot of claims that were, were out there. But in practice, this project really evolved into an immensely detailed set of technical specifications for what private sector investments really contribute to the EU's green objectives. Um, on the one hand, um, those activities, economic activities that reduce greenhouse gas emissions, so things in agriculture, uh, solar energy, wind energy, but also, for example, energy efficient production of steel and cement. On the other hand, also activities that protect the EU economy against the impact of climate change, um, against forest fires, um, removing CO2 from the air. So this is an immensely detailed list of what sort of private sector activity really helps you achieve its economic policy objectives. Now, because it's been, because it's so detailed, it's also sort of the starting point for greening the recovery fund. And the choice that the, the, the EU has really made is to use this recovery for um, moving the EU eco economy more on this green trajectory, now targeting a, a reduction of emissions by 55% 2030. Immensely uh, ambitious stuff. And I think this reflects sort of a broader sense that this recovery is really an immense opportunity, maybe the last opportunity to put the EU economy on this kind of sustainable trajectory. And so the idea of our proposal is then looking at the ECB. And I think the ECB has also signaled that it's interesting doing, in doing something along these lines is to make the uh, refinancing operations in part or entirely conditional on lending that supports these EU green activities that's sort of in line with the um, EU green taxonomy. Okay, now the first question to ask here is of course, is the ECB allowed to do this? Um, yes, the ECB can definitely do this. Um, first observation to make is that the ECB mandate is, is, is general, has some key terms, key objectives, but also assigns a role to the ECB itself to define and implement monetary policy. And then um, looking at the objectives of monetary policy, I think there's really three key arguments for why the ECB should choose to implement green teal TROs and pursue price stability of a sort that, that contributes to um, a, a green transition. So first there is just the basic objective of the inflation target, which um, uh, a, a program of this kind will uh, contribute to, but also, and I'll explain this in more detail, it would contribute to more long-term price stability. So in some ways it will do better in achieving price stability than other programs. Second, of course, the ECB secondary mandates just requires it to support the EU's environmental objectives where this is possible without hindering uh, price stability. And third, a program along these lines will promote financial stability by requiring banks to develop screening and monitoring of the environmental impact of their lending by asking banks to just look at what is the environmental impact of your lending, that will also really contribute in just getting those aspects of lending on the radar of banks. Okay, now moving a bit more uh, uh, to look at more detail on why we think the green teal TROs are really this, this important contribution to price stability. I want to look in a bit more detail on how current regular TLTROs, so what the ECB is currently already doing. And I think Fred will also talk a bit more about how that, that currently looks. I want to compare that with our green TLTRO proposal, specifically with regard to the transmission mechanism. So how the central bank program in the end achieves its objectives in the real economy. Now, 
our key objection to the current TLTRO program is that it's incentivizing banks to do more lending to the real economy, but it doesn't apply any environmental screening. And this means that in practice, at least a part of the investments that occur as a result of the ECB program will go into energy inefficient uh, investments, maybe to construct energy inefficient housing. Uh, people might take out consumer credit to buy combustion engine cars. And these investments will, if you look at short-term price stability, indeed allow the ECB to meet its inflation target of 2% uh, annual increase of consumer prices. But then if you look more towards uh, the, the, the medium-term future, this just sets up the econ EU economy for all sorts of inflationary, inflationary shocks when these investments need to be written off, right? So a lot of these investments are going to occur in sectors where we will think in four years, eight years from now, this is really not where, where the economy should be, where where it currently is. Now, if you compare that to the green teal TROs, then the way in which green teal TROs are designed is such that the investment will by definition fit the EU's long-term trajectory, right? So all this funding will go into the kind of investments of which the EU has today decided that that's where our economy should be in this medium term uh, future. So while the program indeed allows the, the ECB to meet this inflation target in the short run, what's particularly important is that it also allows for growth in line with the more long-term potential of the economy, taking those uh, climate effects into account. And that is of course the ultimate rationale of, of, of price stability that you want real economic development to be sort of in line um, and to uh, have nominal price developments that sort of fits where the, where the real economy is. This has always been the rationale, and I think this just takes that thinking and takes the environmental impact and the transition more seriously. Um, okay, so how will it work in practice, right? And I think that will be very interesting to discuss today. In the uh, report, we sketch both a pilot program and a full program. The, Pilot program, uh, both, both are similar in that they are green TLTROs. So it's cheap funding for banks conditional on taxonomy compliant loans. But it's also true that at the moment, a lot of the operational details of that will still need to be figured out. Uh, for a lot of economic activities, really documenting that they are taxonomy compliant will be difficult only in 2021. Uh, uh, will firms need to will large firms need to report which share of their uh, investment is taxonomy compliant so what we say now recovery focus a pilot program on loans for buildings and renovations um, housing uses 40 percent of energy uh, use in in the eu so it's really important three quarter of eu housing is currently not energy uh, efficient and if you target um, lending on energy efficiency in that sector, that will really make a sizable contribution to uh, greening the economy. We also think that procedurally it can be quite simple. There are energy performance certificates for how energy efficient housing is, and that can be the basis for a, a, a simplified documentation procedure. Now, of course, and this is what people have already picked up, there's also a question how it will work for the whole of the balance sheet. Um, that would be the future long-term project. There, there's really a question whether banks and NCBs will need to develop facilities. There's also a question of benchmarks, right? So how do you make sure that this doesn't massively benefit some banks over others, some member states over others? But um, we are also confident that this is something that uh, ECB can uh, do. Okay, to conclude, let me just summarize. Banks get cheap ECB credit, but only if they issue green taxonomy compliant loans. That's the core of the Green Teal TRO program. We think this program will do better at achieving price stability while also supporting the EU's green agenda and financial stability. It's a program that can start today, but it will become more efficient over time. Thank you. Uh, let me stop. Sorry. Thank you for your uh, time.
Thanks a lot, Jens, for that really, really clear overview of the paper. Um, just one thing I'd like to pick on, up on before I'm moving over to Isabel. Um, what I like about the fix and the, the central role that the taxonomy is playing in this fix is that you know, the question that often comes up in here is that you know, the, um, it, it should, be, should be the lawmakers, it should be Brussels that's taking the lead. Um, the taxonomy is clearly something that you've got to have a lot of political buy-in for. And although many people consider it flawed, this does give the ECB a mechanism whereby they can say the politicians are leading the way and providing the framework which central banks can then use to, um, to, to, to provide their own solutions. So I think that's a, that's a very good, thoughtful way of doing it. Um, so thanks a lot for um, giving us a, a good start to the debate. Um, Isabel, um, I'd like to, to turn to you now and just to find out a little bit more about what the ECB has been doing in terms of, of, of green, green monetary policy and other policies and also to get a sense of what would be maybe the institutional view on this Teltro, green Teltro idea. Cheers. Okay, thank you, Claire. And uh, thank you very much to, to Positive Money to organize this seminar and having me here. Um, it's really an uh, interesting paper to read and it's a pleasure to express here some views. Let me start by sharing my screen. Um, so that you can all see my slides. Here we go. Here we go. Um, so um, in my remarks today, and I have to of course start by saying that um, I'm not giving really an institutional view here. This is still my personal view. I'm uh, uh, representing here myself, not necessarily the views of the ECB. It's the usual disclaimer that we have um, up front always. But so in my remarks today, um, I would like to take briefly a step back and, and present on the, the context in which we are looking at these issues and um, outline some of the work which is already ongoing at the ECB and, and some of the challenges uh, we face. I mean, Claire already hinted at uh, the operational challenges that we face and I'll go a little bit into that and then say a few words on, on the paper itself. So just the context, I mean, it's really on the headline of my slides here. It's that climate shocks have become by now really inevitable. And when I'm thinking of climate shocks, I'm thinking of two types of climate shocks. So one is the physical type of shocks and the other ones are the transition shocks. So physical shocks are the shocks um, associated with the physical effects of climate change. So, you know, these are the very well known ones such as, you know, global warming, warming but also for instance, the increased frequency um, uh, and volatility of, of extreme weather events and natural disasters. So, so this is one, one group of shocks. The other group is more the transition shocks and here we're thinking really of the measures and the shocks needed to bring the economy to a more greener and less polluting one. Right? So either physical or transition shocks have really become inevitable. And I think this chart really nicely demonstrates that. So if you look here from, you know, since 1900, we've seen a steady increase in the global annual CO2 emissions. And scientists more or less agree that if no action is taken, this trend will continue and it will cause quite devastating physical shocks. Maybe not today, but at least within this century. Now, to reverse this trend or to, to basically avoid this, some quite significant transition policies are needed. And I think that year 2020 is really a good case in point here. I mean, this is the year where the pandemic hit. I mean, it had quite devastating impacts on our economies. And some sectors which are actually quite polluting were brought to a grinding halt almost like airlines at, at the peak of the crisis. And if you look at the peak of the pandemic, say lockdown measures or the trough year in terms of activity, you see that global CO2 emissions were only reduced to the 2007 levels. And for the year as a whole, the estimate is now that global CO2 emissions in 2020 will drop between four and 7%. Now estimates would suggest that to meet the Paris agreements, we require an annual drop of 7.6% for the next decade. So that really means you know, that we need big structural changes in our economies to avoid that physical shocks become so predominant. And the second point I want to bring home here on um, the context is that the transition will need to be orderly, ideally, and start now. So here I borrowed some charts from colleagues from the Banque de France who ran some stress testing scenarios. And they looked at the transition uh, path at three different scenarios. One which was an orderly transition. So that's a transition that starts more or less now, And that brings net CO2 emissions at the EU level to zero by 2050. And then two alternative scenarios, one where the transition is sudden, so very rapid. This is the light blue dashed line on the left-hand chart. 
and then a delayed transition. So this is the gray dashed line. So this is just you know doing the transition, but much much later. Now, what I think is interesting here is what you show on the right hand side is the impact on the economy. So this is basically the impact of a delayed or a sudden transition relative to an orderly one. So of course, in the near term, there may be some positive effects, relatively speaking, from a delayed or a sudden transition relative to an orderly one. But in the long run, it's clear that the economic costs will be much bigger if the transition is delayed or happens suddenly. So we all have an interest in making the transition happen as soon as possible in an orderly way. So this is the context. So then the big question is, of course, what role, whether the ECB should play a role in this and what role the ECB could play, right? And here on whether there should be a role for the ECB, the answer is clearly yes. Then the key question is which role? So now if you think in the pr perspective of a prudential supervisor, given the size of the shocks that we are expecting, this is likely to have impacts on the financial sector, which needs to be managed and monitored. So here clearly the ECB has a risk-based approach that is warranted. On monetary policy, of course, uh, maybe I should not remind you, but I will say it again, our primary objective is price stability. Right? But even under our primary man mandate, given the size of the shocks, again, a risk approach could be warranted. There could be risk to our balance sheets, there are risks to the transmission of monetary policy, and even the policy space could be reduced. So if I think of the natural rate of interest, which is already low, there's quite some studies that will argue that uh, climate shocks may actually reduce further the natural rate of interest, physical shocks. So that would not be desirable. However, if you look at the secondary objectives, one can even argue that the ECB could take a catalytic role, right? So the secondary objectives very broadly would say we should take into account the broader economic goals of the union. For those who like to read the legal text, I, I, I pasted it below. But I think it's, it's quite relevant here that we should keep in mind, and I think here that first of all, there's a hierarchy. So if we pursue secondary objectives, it should not be jeopardizing the pursuit of our primary objectives. Uh, secondly, when we pursue our secondary objectives, we should not extend our competences. So we are not a fiscal authority or we are not engaging in industrial policy ourselves. And then finally, a quite challenging question is also how to set priorities amongst the various secondary objectives or other goals, such as um, financial stability. This is, of course, easy if everything works in the same direction, but that's not always the case in life. So all of this is currently under consideration in the ECB strategy review, while this all will be deepened and further worked out. But I think already one can say it's clear that the ECB has a role in this debate. And actually reflecting that the ECB has already taken quite some steps. So I'm not going to talk you through this whole next slide here. It will just take us too long. But just to show that on various levels and uh, dimensions, the ECB has already taken some steps. And just to note that actually on the banking sector and the lending approach, um, which is point of discussion in Jens's paper with his co-authors, so far the ECB has taken a slightly different approach in that the aim has been more from the prudential supervision side that banks monitor and manage their exposure to climate-related and environmental risks. In that sense, there's also a guide for coming from the SSM. And actually we see so far that that approach has had some success already because banks have reduced their exposure to very carbon intensive industries um, in, in your area. So, but at the same time, while I show you here that we have been doing quite a lot and I hope I can convince you that we are taking action, we are often blamed to be very slow or take only piecemeal steps forward. Uh, and I want to like to stress that this is really not because of unwillingness. I think, you know, can refer to what President Lagarde has said or Isabel Schnabel in recent speeches. We are very much taking this matter serious and looking into that, but there are some challenges that hold us back. And I would just like to talk you briefly through this, and they will also tie that into the paper. So the first challenge is, of course, we want to do things well. And here a key question is, what is green? This is just an exemplary chart here on the left hand side. But basically, these are environmental scores by Bloomberg and Refinitiv on the vertical axis. And the higher the score, basically, the better the performance in terms of environmental variables. So if everybody agrees on what is environmental or what is better environmental, you would see a more or less 45 degree line between these scores. So when it's high on Bloomberg, it should be high on the Refinitiv score. Instead, what you see is very often that there's still big disagreement. And that's really the problem. We do not always know what is green. And so a key question, and this is on the right hand side chart, what you define as green? Is it the direct exposure or is it also the upstream and downstream indirect exposures? It can make quite some difference. 
And here, of course, what you already referred to, the EU taxonomy is really key and crucial, and we very much welcome that. And we also have some people who are very actively engaged in this debate because we think it's very important. But there are still some challenges remaining on the, on the taxonomy. And this is just things that will take time. It will come there. But first, we need also a brown taxonomy, not just a green taxonomy. And the second challenge is that the final details of the regulation will be introduced through delegated acts and come into force only by the end of 2022. So while this X will be published actually already next year, it may take some time for companies, especially given how granular the taxonomy is, to set up infrastructure and to start disclosing accordingly. Similarly, banks will have to set up their monitoring system. So this is really a matter of timing. Yeah. Then besides the classification, we also face some challenges on disclosure and on monitoring. So on disclosure, I'm just borrowing here a chart from some BIS colleagues who have a paper I can very much recommend you all to read. And here they show basically the share of firms, of listed firms that disclose carbon emissions across 42 countries. So there, there's a break in 2016 because they extended the sample of, of firms included. But by the end of the sample, you see more or less 35% of firms have been disclosing their carbon emissions. So this is for large firms, right? Imagine for SMEs and small companies that are so important in Europe. We have really some way to go to in, in increase this disclosure. And then the most important thing is the monitoring itself. So we don't, you want to be greening the economy, we don't want to be greenwashing it, right? And so here on the right hand side from the same paper, these colleagues, they basically tracked companies that issued green bonds and they looked at the carbon intensity after the green bond issuance. And so the yellow line shows that after the issuance, after at time T1, 2 and 3, you see actually a reduction in carbon intensity according to scope 1 definition. But according to scope 1 to 3 definition, so the broader when you also take into account the indirect effect, then you see that actually the carbon intensity has increased. And of course, you want to avoid that if you get into a green policy that we end up having a policy that may be even counterproductive or not achieving its aim. So monitoring is really key. Now, the next key challenge that we face, and that's really relating mainly to our purchase programs, is market size. There's just not so much out there to buy, to be honest. So on the left-hand side chart, you can see from the total green universe that we have available under our PSPP and CSPP, we hold around 25, 20%, right? So 25 rounds for the PSPP and 20% in the CSPP. But then if you look on the right-hand side chart and you see how big the green universe is compared to the total universe where we can purchase, it's really, really tiny. And this is not because there's no demand in the market for such bonds. It's just that there's a lack of supply. And there are two factors there which are quite crucial and which are important to overcome over time. First is the negative climate change externality, we call it. So what it means is that high carbon intensity or technologies still have a competitive edge over low carbon intensive technologies. And the reason for that is basically that the externalities that these high carbon intensive um, technologies have is still not internalized. I mean, in economics, we usually say that can be overcome with the Pigovium tax, the carbon tax, right? And we have not moved far enough in that direction yet to create clearly these incentives to move to low carbon intensive in technologies. And the second issue is that there are technological externalities. Any firm that engages in greening its investment or greening its company and makes some technological advancements, it's a common interest, but that also means it may have to share it with other companies. And so nobody's willing to be the first one who has to incur the cost and have the others benefit from them. So that issue needs to also be overcome. But for a central bank, if you're operating an environment where the market size is relatively small, and there is actually sufficient private sector demand for green bonds, a key question then is if an overly engaged central bank with an overly substantial green QE does not risk actually killing the market with kindness. Because if you're so active, it may in fact reduce the incentives for other investors to enter the market and buy these bonds. So against that background, the paper that is presented today is actually very interesting because, of course, it puts the emphasis on another part of our uh, monetary policy portfolio, namely the Teltros. I mean, the timing is also very welcome of the paper because, well, we're in the ECB listen mode in the context of the strategy review, so we're really looking for proposals and suggestions that we can cooperate in our thinking and that broaden our thinking. However, at this stage, I would like to highlight some caveats and some questions to the authors that they may want to take into account and may want to broaden their paper onto. And they stretch mainly along two dimensions, these comments. The first is to really keep expectations within check. I mean, this is not going to be 
the silver bullet. And the second dimension is that we need to take into account a number of considerations when designing such instruments, as not doing so either risk that we don't achieve our aim or even actually work counterproductively, or that there may be undesirable side effects. So on the details of the questions, I have split them here in four blocks, and I will just briefly talk you through them. So my first point is that we need to keep in mind what is the objective of the green cell trials. So as I mentioned before, um, the, the secondary, if you achieve, try to aim for the secondary objectives, it should not jeopardize the ECB's achieving its primary objective. And so in this case, this would mean that the green Teltro program should not cannibalize in some ways the regular Teltro programs, which in the current environment aim to avoid firm closure and increase in unemployment. So the focus on a small and targeted scheme, as Jens has proposed for loans, for buildings and renovations aimed at energy efficient retrofitting would be a good way to start as it doesn't seem to interfere with our regular Teltro programs. A second point is on the timing, where we need to really be realistic. I think in the paper it was suggested that this could be rolled out within weeks. I mean, Jens said this can be rolled out today. I have here some, some doubts, yeah? Um, so the first doubt is that the timing may not be ideal. I know that's always uh, easy to say, it's never an ideal timing, but we're really still in the liquidity crisis. We have not started the recovery phase. And in a phase where companies just fight for survival, they go to the bank to ask for loans just to finance their running costs. It's much better to focus on greening once we have reached the recovery phase. We don't want to, at this point, trigger a firm closure of brown firms simply because they cannot get over the survival phase. These brown firms, we actually want them to become green, but we should give them the times and the means to do so, and that should be focused in the recovery phase. So I don't think a liquidity crisis timing is the ideal. In that regard, I should say at the EU level, if you look at the, at the policies, you have also two leg policies. You had the Eurogroup agreeing on crisis fighting measures and the next generation EU focusing on the recovery and the focus on green is in the recovery phase. Or besides that, I have also some other issues which really relate to the operationalization. And I think here I tie into what, what Claire has already hinted at that indeed it's not always so easy to implement um, such a green Teltro. And the first point is that um, it takes some time um, for this taxonomy to feed through into firms disclosure or households, banks monitoring and the euro system, right? So the taxonomy I said is very granular and it will take some time to set up all our systems. The banks need to do so, but even the euro system, we need to set up a monitoring system in place. For the moment, we ask corporates whether they lend to households or to businesses. Here, we would need to know if they're also lending green or not. So all these steps are time intensive and they should not be underestimated. And they're also quite important. As I mentioned before, we want to green the economy. We don't want to greenwash the economy, right? So we want to do it well. And for that, we need to be patient and get some time. Another point is that the regulatory framework should be very supportive of green investment. And I know in Europe, you're moving towards that. But here, we cannot be ahead of the curve in that sense that um, if the regulatory environment is not supportive, why would firms and households get these loans? At the end of the day, we're still asking them to take on a debt. We may make the supply of these loans easier and we may make the cost of them lower, but we're still asking them to take on that debt. So there needs to be an, more than an incentive in terms of lowering the financing costs. So that's what I mean with the Teltro, you're kind of leading the horse to the water, but that doesn't mean you can, can make him drink. There needs to be a demand for these loans as well. And there the regulatory environment can play an important role. A third consideration, which maybe may, is worth delving a bit more into, is on the potential side effects. I'm thinking here exactly on the loans for the housing and the building retrofitting. Housing is actually the market segment that has been doing quite well in the current COVID crisis. House prices have increased in the second quarter still by 5%. And when asking construction firms what's holding back um, the construction, this is a survey that is monthly conducted by the EU Commission, then firms, actually construction firms say it's not demand holding them back. It's basically lack of availability of material, or just the general lockdown measures that, that complicate their work. So this sector is actually quite thriving. So we need to be careful if we put stimulus into this sector that we are not ending up with uh, runaway in house prices and housing bubbles. A second smaller point here on the side effects to keep in mind and which Jens already alerted to, is that we need to make sure, and this is not a legal issue, it's more an economic issue, that we don't create further cross-country divergences by these measures. Currently, there's quite an asymmetric distribution of policy-built borrowers of green loans. Part of this is related to differences in fiscal frameworks. 
and we don't want to add further heterogeneity across Euro-area countries. Of course, here an important way to overcome this is to have a more commonality in the regulation across Europe and more common approaches. And finally, my more fundamental question is, and point to keep in mind, is that Teltros should not be seen as a silver bullet. So taking into account the points I just mentioned before, a realistic program would most likely start to be small and take some time to be rolled out, offering some incentives but could not be path breaking. It would be an accompanying tool to what happens on the regulatory environment. However, there are also other ways to achieve this goal, and we need to trade off the pros and cons, right? As I said, in the end of the day, Teltros is focusing, the green Teltros would focus on banks giving loans, green loans. But what happens to the overall balance sheet of the bank and what the bank engages in lending would not be controlled through these green Teltros, right? Whereas a supervisory measure can be much more wide encompassing. Moreover, as noted, what I said before, firms would need to rake up debt under this scheme. However, given that these are structural investments, there's quite a number of studies that say that equity will be better placed than debt. And so we may also want to look at developing the equity market. And a final point, climate change is really a structural problem. It's not related to the business cycle, whereas our Teltro and our instruments are not structural in nature. And that should be something to keep in mind. And so to sum up, I think this is a really great proposal. I think it's a good basis for thinking and we will definitely reflect further upon that at the ECB. I would say at general ECB, we say we are very willing to engage in this debate. At the same time, in the previous crisis, it was often said that the ECB should not be the only game in town. I think the problem with the climate change is sometimes that the town is yet not there. The town still needs to be constructed. So it's not that we're the only game. We're just waiting for sometimes the town to still come out. But thank you very much for giving me the chance to comment on this. And I pass the floor back to, to Claire. Thanks a lot for that, Isabel. That was a really excellent presentation, not just in the sense of giving us an idea of what the ECB has been doing on this topic and what its thoughts on it are and your own kind of points on the, on the paper, which I'm going to ask Jens to address in a second. Um, I also got a great sense of just how tricky it is to fine tune the economic incentives. And not just that, but the sheer scale of the information problem. Um, a few of the questions that people have been asking. Um, they're excellent, by the way, the questions from the audience, so please keep on asking them. We will come to them shortly. Um, ju just grapple with that topic of, okay, you can, with the best will in the world, if, if, if the banks aren't able to do the report and then there's not the regulatory framework in place, then it's hard to see how you can get the traction you desire. Um, I'd like to move on to Fred in a second, but before I do, I'd just like to give Jens the the right to reply on, on some of the comments from Isabel. So Jens, if you want to take the floor briefly. Yeah, um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll stay brief. This is, uh, I think, incredibly um, helpful. And also, I mean, there's so much that you've said that I completely agree with. Uh, so let me just say something about two points where I think maybe the Green Teltro proposal is, it can respond a bit more uh, to, to points you have raised and that might have been clear from how I've already presented it. Um, so on the one hand, this issue of disclosure and monitoring and deciding are, are banks really doing something that's green? I mean, I completely agree with the issue of greenwashing. That can absolutely not be the, the goal of this proposal. As you've also already mentioned, the ECB is currently also doing a lot on this issue on the uh, banking supervision side. But I think if you look there in detail uh, in the draft, what's currently happening, I am a bit more pessimistic what banks are already doing from that uh, guideline. I also take that most banks are just doing almost zero, really monitoring the impact of their um, uh, uh, lending. And I think there, uh, you currently have a supervisory approach, which is about dialogue, and um, uh, there's currently no real real role for this in prudential requirements, so in bank capital requirements. And I think there, um, having a program that really asks banks to monitor this and um, uh, asking banks to develop these capacities can really strengthen what's happening on the supervision side. So there, I think what on the one hand might be uh, uh, seen as a disadvantage of the program that banks have to put all this uh, monitoring and disclosing into place is actually a strength of the proposal. So just by asking banks to do this, I think that that would really uh, help. 
And then I think, I mean, um, is it a silver bullet? Um, clearly not yet. Um, but um, I also think uh, that the the pilot might might have a bit stronger case for going for it, really starting it relatively quickly. So I think you're, you're right that maybe starting it today is, is an overstatement, but starting to set this up today and moving in that direction, I think would, would be uh, feasible and, and desirable. Um, and I want to pick up one specific point, which I think really illustrates the key issue, what you've said that um, currently in construction, uh, a Builders are saying, well, look, we can build whatever we want. We're not suffering from, from not having enough credit. But that is also part of the problem, right? So there's currently just a lot of construction going on made possible by, by ECB monetary policy, by low credit, which is building houses, refurbishing houses in ways that are not energy efficient. So this might superficially contribute um, to... Uh, um, helping the EU from, from the, the economy from, from the current crash and, and supporting economic activity. But a lot of this activity might be really transient if there's a real serious commitment to the environmental objectives in, in the coming 10 years. So, so there I would say, yes, I, I think, um, of course, um, it's important to look at the uh, short term, the real shock that the economy has, but also, I think this is really the right moment to look at the ways in which uh, monetary policy might uh, push certain investments to take place that we actually don't really want to uh, happen. And, and over time, I think that that could be um, more generally how ECB refinancing operations uh, work, that some, some investments that really don't contribute to long-term price stability don't benefit from this low interest rate environment. Thanks for that, Jens. Um, could we now move on to Frederic, please? Thank you. Thank you, Claire. And thank, Cheers, you for Fred. The, thank you for the great presentations. Um, I'm supposed to provide a bit of a, of a view from the private sector. Hope you can see the slide. Um, but just for full disclosure, I'm not defending any interest here because uh, the private sector can be seen as the, the devil's advocate, at least uh, in this kind of topic. Uh, and I'm certainly not working also for retail banks. I'm not benefiting, actually. My employer uh, isn't from, from Teltros uh, for full disclosure. But the point also, um, more broadly, I would say as, a, as an introduction is that um, I am personally a big fan of Teltros. I think everyone should be uh, especially in the euro area uh, with a disintermediated uh, funding structure, uh, which has been very efficient and DCB has a lot of experience with this tool. Having said that, banks are no, usually no big fan uh, of Tetris. It's not a gift to bankers, as I can hear uh, from time to time from observers, because uh, the broader picture is one of huge, super ample excess liquidity, 3 trillion uh, euros today in the euro area a banking system, uh, which is being taxed, if I may, at 50 basis points. So uh, with very low interest rates and super uh, large excess liquidity, it's still a very challenging environment for banks. So let me just put this caveat first. Uh, uh, it's certainly something that has to be um, discussed in the, in the broader macro financial picture. Having said that, I am indeed personally a big fan uh, of Teltros. The ECB has a long history. Uh, it's not hopefully the last tool really operational, it's just for the, for the title, but it's one that has been very effective, very flexible, uh, very um, well suited, as I said, to the structure of the, of the euro area, banking sector and economy. Think of 2011 first, uh, that's when uh, arguably Mario Draghi saved the euro first, uh, the first time with VLTOs. Uh, this was a, already a, a, a very powerful tool, less uh, uh, of a bazooka than QE, but something that helped dramatically to improve the situation and reduce financial fragmentation. Then uh, think more recently of another extreme, on the other extreme of the, of the spectrum, Peltros, uh, small banks, it's not about the size of the overall facilities, uh, it's about targeting the liquidity and the term funding, uh, vis providing visibility to banks, 
including those very small banks that cannot access other operations or uh, the wholesale market to fund the economy, to fund small and medium enterprises in particular. So with this whole spectrum of Teltros, the ECB, ECB has been able to really target uh, uh, the liquidity and improve uh, the transmission of monetary policy. I'd just like to focus on one of those uh, features of uh, past Teltros and uh, see how we can, uh, how the ECB could uh, possibly uh, transition to green Teltros, how they could secure, if not strengthen, some of those features of the Teltros that are so important, in my opinion. And I will uh, raise a few challenges, uh, very much echoing what Isabel just said. As I said, they've been uh, those Teltros and LTROs before them uh, very efficient. Uh, in improving the transmission of monetary policy. This is a chart that we use to update every single month in the, at the height of the crisis, uh, the bank lending rates on new loans to SMEs, on new small loans, let's say, up to 1 million euros. And you can see that there is basically no more differences, no more spreads uh, between countries. Financial fragmentation uh, has been all but eliminated. Not only thanks to El Teltros, obviously, this is, uh, as we skew the problem of the counterfactual, if you want to provide an empirical estimate of the actual effect, it's impossible, let's be honest. But uh, there has been, at the very least, a complementary positive effect of Teltros and asset purchases, which has led to this very favorable situation. Teltros has been, have been also very flexible, as I said. Uh, the history of the changes to the modalities, Teltros 1, 2, 3, in terms of maturities, in terms of interest rates, uh, um, I mean, make it very clear that the ECB has uh, been able to adjust uh, those terms and conditions to the reality of the economy. I have to, adjust, uh, to add to this that um, the point today is not to decide uh, what the, the, the most uh, uh, acceptable policy measures would be. We are thinking about the long-term future, the climate change challenges, which should trump all those, uh, those considerations. But uh, it's also important as a pragmatist, at least, to, to, to look at those uh, policies that are politically correct, acceptable, consensual, and the Teltro is probably the most politically consensual uh, policy that the ECB right, has right now. If there's one thing maybe I could disagree uh, respectfully with Isabel is that, to me, they are structural in nature now, and I would very much imagine the ECB making them permanent. It's very difficult to see how uh, at least in a foreseeable future, or you can just remove term funding to the banking sector as we have it today. Uh, uncertainty is here to stay, and I would assume that uh, Teltros are here to stay as well. Uh, the last thing, obviously, is uh, in terms of um, credit transmission, which uh, is ultimately the most important transmission channel of Teltros. It's in the name. Uh, here as well, it's difficult to, to make any strong case for the counterfactual. Who knows what uh, credit supply would have been without Teltros? But at the very least, uh, they have uh, been, uh, I mean, they have come along and, and probably amplified the effect of other policy measures on the, on the uh, credit cycle. So I would say that first, it's a very good and probably the best candidate, in my view, to use as a tool from the ECB to play an active role, if any, in the uh, transition to, to, to a more sustainable economy. Uh, it's also uh, probably much easier to do than with CSPP or asset purchases. Think, think about all the distortion that we could uh, imagine uh, with the ECB stepping in the market directly. It's being discussed and it will be discussed in the future. And maybe the ECB will do green QE eventually, but with Teltros, uh, uh, to me, the challenges are much more manageable. And last but not least, I think in, in, the, in the proposal, what I mean, strikes me as the, one of the most interesting uh, ideas is to come up with a pilot program. I will come back to this, but if its uh, size is well calibrated, it's, if it's not too small uh, to have an effect and not too large to avoid too big uh, distortions and side effects, then it's a really good uh, way to, to, go, to, to, to start and kickstart such a program in the future. So let me just focus on a few uh, challenges now um, and questions. First, I very much agree, uh, there's no way we go to uh, 1.3 trillion, 2 trillion green teltros overnight, and probably not even uh, in a matter of weeks, even though Jens would, uh, would like to try it. Uh, uh, it's possible, but probably over a longer time horizon. And it's no silver bullet. You don't want to kill a fly with a hammer. All those things that you want to, to avoid also with teltros, 
uh, ultimately uh, you want to avoid them uh, with, with uh, green telcos. A lot of the questions we've had uh, in terms of the uh, challenges, operational and implementation issues uh, have to do with the transition to the new regime, if there is a new regime. So imagine if we, uh, if the ECB had uh, set a goal of uh, uh, transitioning to green telcos only or mainly uh, over the next, um, I don't know, five years, uh, then uh, the transition has to be discussed uh, very extensively to make sure that banks have the right incentives to keep the funding to real economy, to increase the funding to green projects without uh, distorting the existing uh, schemes. In my opinion, the ECB will have to extend even Teltro 3, the normal ones, uh, in terms of maturity, possibly even lowering interest rates. If they do this, the transition to green Teltro's could be even more challenging because you don't want to uh, you know, we want to run the two programs uh, together and uh, as much as possible, don't create, uh, um, I mean, don't um, go against the level playing field uh, idea and uh, keep the singleness of monetary policy, which is something that the authors uh, make clear in the report. In terms of uh, the, specifically the green teltro, the two main challenges I see would be first, uh, the pricing and second, uh, the benchmark. It's already very complicated, to be honest, when you go into the, the documentations, the legal doc for the, of the Teltros, I think we are uh, a few of us looking at all the details and actually understanding them, even if uh, Isabel uh, Schnabel this time had, uh, had great explainers, it's, it's complicated. If you come up with something more complicated than that, it's a problem. And I will actually this time take the, um, by my experience, the, the, the perspective of the banks. We have approximately 100, 100 to 200 large banks benefiting from Teltros and then all the others counterparts of the ECB and all the others, the very small uh, banks that are not part of a group Teltros, for instance, they will find it very hard to uh, go through all the documentations and fill in uh, the questionnaires, the, uh, the Excel files. It sounds a bit uh, specific, but it's a, it's a reality. Sometimes it's actually a, a hurdle for banks to uh, even participate and bid into the Teltros. Uh, so this is something to bear in mind because you need to keep it simple. Simple is beautiful also for, for green Teltros, I believe, in the future as much as possible, avoid uh, uh, too much bureaucracy and, and complexity. In terms of the pricing, uh, one thing that perhaps is lacking in the report and to be, to be addressed later on is the fact that we have already dual rates. You were, we have already a minus 1% on the Teltro 3 minus 50 basis points if you don't comply with the benchmark or with uh, Peltros, with other uh, refinancing operation, and zero for uh, main refinancing operation that are no longer used, but in the future could be. So if you have two, three, if not four interest rates, it's also a bit of a problem. It's a bit of a problem also in terms of the segmentations in the money markets that we've seen recently uh, can lead to some uh, um, yeah, uh, problems in terms of competitions, in terms of uh, unsecured lending in the money market, which you need absolutely to keep working uh, in the future. In terms of benchmark, this was something that was addressed, uh, how much banks could actually get from Teltros, green Teltros. Um, it depends obviously on how much they could lend uh, in the taxonomy, but it could also, as the authors uh, propose, be discriminated uh, within or among countries, uh, within sectors. This sounds also a bit uh, of a red hurdle for the, for the ECB if they want to keep the singleness of monetary policy. The counter argument to this is that you have already in place a framework, think of uh, additional collateral framework, for instance, where the national central banks could take over. That's actually what the, what the paper um, also uh, floats as an idea to come up with something which is more decentralized and more uh, specific to each country. Again, if the size of green teltros is relatively contained in the future relative to overall teltros, that's maybe not a problem because you uh, tolerate something that is uh, um, going on in parallel with the other tools. But if it's ultimately the main tool of the ECB in five to 10 years or earlier, then it could be a problem because you don't want uh, Italian banks to benefit from a different benchmark or pricing of green teltros than French banks or, or German banks. Something to bear in mind. Uh, last but not least, collateral. Uh, those uh, loans would be collateralized. Uh, the collateral could be, uh, it was François Villeroy de Gallo and other uh, ECB governing council members who floated the idea, also 
um, discriminated in terms of green or non-green with haircuts being also uh, reflecting a, a more or less attractive uh, pricing. If that's the case, then you have a double effect of green teltrols, which maybe needs to be mitigated because you don't want to, uh, or maybe you, you do, but you would uh, provide a double benefit to banks compared with, uh, um, with banks lending uh, to, to, to green projects and corporates or households compared with, uh, with others. On mortgages, I think that's also a very, as I said, a very interesting idea of the, um, the paper. Uh, as a, just briefly the numbers uh, you, so that you have them in mind, the overall eligible pool of loans for Teltros in the euro area in uh, earlier last year was 5.8 trillion euros. That excludes mortgages, 5.8 trillion. Uh, but mortgages today are around 4.6 trillion. So it's 80% of, of, of the overall uh, eligible pool of, of loans. It's quite significant. And if you add this, even a small size initially of those mortgages uh, which could comply with EU uh, green taxonomy, this would add uh, a huge amount uh, to potential Tetros uh, allowances. So you have to calibrate this in order for the size ultimately uh, to be in the range of what would be seen as, as desirable. And this leads me to my final uh, observation. We are uh, today in a, a world, as I said, of huge uh, level of excess liquidity, three trillion. It's not all due to Teltros, 1.3 trillion in June, but also to, to asset purchases, obviously. But Teltros have contributed to this and also created some distortion. So when you think about green Teltros, uh, you should be bear these distortions in mind to avoid uh, perhaps side effects in the future. We've seen, for instance, your eyeball rates going down below uh, the deposit rate of the ECB, which is not something that is really desirable. For banks, uh, it's actually a, a, a bigger um, he headwind than uh, the tailwind provided by Teltros on their overall net income. So this is something to, to bear in mind. If you add even a, actually a smaller size, uh, in September, banks came for 175 billion in the, in the last Teltro. Uh, then it had actually an impact on excess uh, liquidity. It had an impact on the margins on unsecured uh, money market rates. This is something that uh, has to also uh, be taken into account. And really, sorry, my last point here on a broader uh, scale uh, that would add to uh, also the risk and other trade-offs uh, related to Teltros. To me, much less important, more manageable with other policy tools than the one I just mentioned. But the idea that banks can still uh, take uh, the opportunity of doing something else with the cash than just uh, lending to green projects, uh, corporates and households, or to the real economy for, the, for, for that matter, uh, including uh, holding more sovereign debt could be a problem. Uh, if you make Teltros permanent or more structural uh, feature of the ECB's toolkit, this is something that is far from being addressed. Again, a side topic uh, compared with everything we've, we've been discussing today. But as you can see in Italy in particular, uh, the Teltro probably have also uh, contributed to the increased share of uh, domestic government bond holdings in the bank's balance sheet, which is something that is uh, not consistent with the ultimate objective of the banking union. I am fully aware of the fact that it's not uh, up to the ECB uh, to deal with this, but this is also something perhaps to have in, uh, in mind when thinking about green Teltro. And I'll stop here. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks a lot for that, Fred. Really interesting presentation and plenty of food for thought. It really nicely sets us up for some elements of our Q&A as well. Um, there's been quite a few questions on one of the points you raised about pricing, um, both for Jens and for Isabel, I think. I mean, one, a few people have mentioned this, this dual rate structure that you touched on and how the, the green Teltro pricing really fits into that. So it'd be good if Jens could address that. And then um, just on your point, Isabel, a few people have had a question about, you know, you're saying this is, this is the case where the demand has to already be there and there's not so much that the Teltro can do about that. Um, there has been a little bit of skepticism raised about that with the idea that, well, can you not just make it so attractively priced? that um, it kind of like, it, it does actually 
boost the supply just because it does kind of like feed into to creating a lot more demand basically um Jens if you maybe go first and maybe spell out a little bit in a little bit more detail what you envision in terms of the pricing and yeah. then we can move to Isabel too on the same issue yeah yeah thanks um also thanks super uh helpful uh, comments and exactly what i was hoping would be talking about all these operational details right how you really <laughs> do it because sure. no, nobody knows right it's 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 too early um on the pricing let me say something very big picture, right? So we come from a thinking about monetary policy where there is one interest rate and that is the tool of monetary policy. And with that one interest rate, you signal a general stance of where you think the economy should be going. And that's then transmitted via money markets, via banks to the real economy. And I think it's Fred also described, right? That we've moved away from that world already uh, quite a lot. Um, and so while on the one hand, I think um, uh, there are risks there, that's also part just of, of the proposal itself, right? So specifically when it comes to uh, green or uh, not green lending, there's really, an, it's also part of the policy stance, right? It's really saying, look, we're accommodative for this kind of credit, we're much less accommodative for, for other uh, other kinds of economic activity and in that sense you're you're moving away from this idea of the central bank just pushing the economy into uh, a general increase of of uh, activity towards the central bank that says well also from a perspective of price stability also from perspective of long-term uh, economic development we have to make certain choices where where the econ economy then goes and then um then how that that works in practice um specifically on pricing um already uh, so this is this is a, a very very important observation it's in the report the amount of uh loans that will be eligible for green teal tiros will quickly be more than currently uh teal tiro funding across the board right so that's just um because uh, you know, bank, European bank balance sheets like 30 trillion, something like that. So then a few percent of that will already quite quickly be um, enough. So you need a form of, of, of uh, a rule to determine how much green lending gives you access to how much um, green teal TRO also um, uh, thereby affecting the overall cost of refinancing of a bank, right? So there will be super cheap green TLTRO, possibly also other sources of refinancing. Um, and how to do that in practice, that, that something needs to be calibrated. It's already the case for TLTROs, right? So um, TLTROs are available for a percentage of uh, uh, consumer credit and uh, lending to firms, right? So only a percentage of the 5.8 trillion uh, gives you access to, to TLTROs. And I think here there's just matter of finding a formula that makes green TL TRO sufficiently scarce, right? It shouldn't be that everybody has sufficient green loans to, to access it, but also make sure that um, banks have access to it. And that may bring to the main last point, yes, there is a risk of some member states having just much less green taxonomy compliant loans than others. That would be a risk to the level playing field. I don't think that's a risk for housing, right? Everywhere in the EU, there's this massive housing stock that currently is not, not green, it's not energy efficient. So I think there, we're, as far as I can see, not really in a territory where you say, look, there's really a, a, a distortion of, of monetary policy because some banks find it easier to access it. Um, but once you move further with the program, yes, that will become important, right? It can't be that uh some banking sectors really disproportionately benefit and and you'll have to see in practice whether that uh, happens so claire do you want me to jump in right away or yes please um okay yeah, thanks a lot <laughs> yeah so on, on your specific question um on uh to what extent that as i mentioned you know if there's no demand for a product i mean we cannot really create it i mean i agree that of course if a loan would become you know, easier available, 
worth in terms of terms and conditions, of course, that would create to some extent a demand. But there's, of course, a limit of how far we can go, right? I mean, you know, there's also a reason why we set a, a certain floor on our, our interest rate. So, I mean, how far we can go in terms of overstimulating the market is a big question mark. And another question implicitly is it's giving some sort of a subsidy. But if you oversubsidize a certain market segment, I think, you know, a clear example of that has been in the past solar panels, right? If you subsidize it too much, what happens is the price of solar panels go up, right? So. Um, that, that's where you know you, you have a limit to how much you can do if there's really no demand in the market and we have seen that in the past actually just to give a related example on our abs purchase program so it's not the telter here but the purchase program which was aimed also to get the abs market going right but if the regulation doesn't move in step with you i mean you know you're not really going to create a market you know so the ecb also in that case was trying to be a bit more of a catalyst and that really didn't fly because the regulation wasn't moving so much in lockstep and i think here that was kind of what i was trying uh, to refer to. There's one side point I wanted to just mention because it came up quite a few times now and is on the housing side, right? So first of all, Teltros are not geared towards the, the mortgage market, right? So we have benchmarks which are not on the mortgage side. And so you see already that the housing market is doing quite well. So what we're saying here is adding an additional subsidy for green housing, right? So that's why I'm, I'm highlighting the risk of side effects and basically of potentially creating bubbles. We need to be aware Money is kind of fungible. I think Frederick was also referring to that when he was saying, what, what will banks do with, with these trial throws? The money flows, we don't necessarily control it, right? We've, we try to incentivize that it's used for specific lending, but we don't forbid that it goes into other directions, right? So banks still decide to whom to lend, right? And that's why I say if regulation moves in step, that it becomes much more favorable to lend to green parts of the economy than brown parts, Banks will also adjust their incentives. We do not necessarily only give, have to give financial incentives to that. I think we need to have a much uh, broader regulatory environment. Thanks. And just on this, this issue of the housing bubble, I think this came up in the Q&A as well, is like to what, um, to what degree do you potentially mitigate the bubble that we're now seeing in some parts of the, the housing, um, you know, the residential and the commercial real estate markets in Europe? If you have a policy like this and it does lead to um, an increase in supply of high quality housing. I mean, if we're, if we're going to get investment that either upgrades the existing stock or some of these funds devoted to new builds, um, does that not you know, mitigate the impacts of a bubble rather than fueling one perhaps? Well, I mean, if you're thinking about housing in terms of affordability, it should make housing also potentially to some extent a bit more expensive, right? So, I mean, and you're still competing within the same market. If you're a construction firm, whether you're constructing on the brown or the green, I'm not sure these firms are so different. So you're competing for your resources. So if you just increase the demand for a certain resource, I could still see, imagine that the prices may go up. I mean, I'm just saying that because we're in a market environment where you know, there, there's no lack of demand for housing. I agree that we would want to have it going greener, but, you know, the best way to do this is have regulation in place to ask for certain standards, for instance, on new housing, right? Um, you know, and then you can have measures that come along with that that makes it on the financial side more easier. But if you have already in the current environment such a significant amount for housing, we need to be careful that we don't price for certain people, you price them out of the market segment, basically. And this is also part of the reason why the Teltros never really were so focused on the mortgage market because there was always this fear on the housing sector. So we need to look at that carefully. I don't, I don't rule out anything, right? I'm not a decision maker. I'm not the ECB governing council, but I'm just highlighting the kind of concerns that we would have and that we need to look at carefully before embarking in these directions. Maybe that would be a good, good place to come to another question on, you know, what, what are the next steps in terms of the strategic re review? I mean, you mentioned that this paper is very welcome in the sense that the ECB is now undergoing a new strategic review. It wants to speak to the public. It wants to look at how these discussions will feed into, you know, the debate about its inflation target and other aspects of its policy armory. What's the sort of process now? We've already seen Lagarde react to the paper. Um, there was an article earlier today with um, some other reactions from Isabel Schnabel and um, Jens Weidmann. Um, which I believe Jens is going to comment on shortly. Oh, Jens, not 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 Byron Jens. Um, but I mean, if you could maybe just spell out to to the viewers what what happens next in terms of the strategic review on policies such as those suggested in this paper, then I think that would be fantastic. Well, so basically, what we have ongoing currently is the ECB listen. So you know, this is of course one uh, basically paper, but we're collecting a lot of suggestions, right? And so. Um, 
currently basically staff and, and that's actually within the euro system right so it's not just ecb it's always the whole euro system that is reflecting and, and thinking and, and and providing inputs and ideas that basically are then channeled into the governing council who will then have reflections on that so there are several seminars in that regard in the in the strategy review process so and there's one seminar specifically devoted to to the issues of climate change right so that's already signals that you know there's a lot of importance attached to it where you know the governing council will be served with a lot of documentation and thinking and then of course it's up to them they are the decision makers how they wish to take that forward basically so um this is more or less a process so we're currently into the thinking process and also gathering information from outside i mean we also have conferences where we listen and um so you know many proposals are welcome because of course it enriches our thinking so that's why i'm very happy that the you know this proposal came and that we can discuss this here today and jens and frederick do, would you care to comment on the, the bloomberg article earlier today uh, yeah i mean uh, um Look, I think overall, I think we should be incredibly uh, grateful for the way in which ESA, uh, the ECB has responded to this proposal. Also, again, uh, Isabel's amazing uh, comments today. As a as sort of historian of the ECB, I can really say this has not always been uh, uh, the 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 attitude. is really a big shift, and I think that's 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 really great and 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 welcome. And then I think, yeah, uh, well, I think on the one hand, Schnabel. Uh, also tweeted that today that she really does uh, 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 like the proposal and that something in the Bloomberg article really doesn't accurately reflect her general attitude towards the proposal. And then, yeah, uh, Weidmann, of course, has uh, quite a track record of opposing uh, innovative ECB uh, programs, and he's not always been successful in uh, opposing them. So. Uh, the M OMT and the uh, asset purchase programs are there, and maybe that's actually a, a promising sign that yeah, Weidmann is initially a bit hesitant. It might still happen. So it's a positive externality then that we found in today's discussion. Fantastic. Um, there's 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 a lot more questions. I mean, keep keep them coming. And there's quite a live debate as well in the chat. Um, about some aspects of building materials and so on and so forth. Um, one issue that I would like to touch on before we go to is just, I mean, a few questions have touched on how does this play into the, the, the broader price stability debate? Um, does it mean that because you know, one person raised the issue of because you're discriminating against certain sorts of investments for good or bad reasons? Um, that could potentially have a short-term negative impact on, on, on growth or inflation. Um, and if that's the case, then does it make you less likely to hit, hit the price stability target? Um, on the other side, the, you know, other people might say that the price stability target has been missed for many years now and does introducing a new policy perhaps make it more likely that we're going to hit it? So, It'd be good to get a sense, I think, from from Frederick and from from Jens of what they what they think of this. Maybe I can ju just add a few uh, a few comments about sure. that. Um, th there's a there's maybe a similarity with the idea of uh, of um, the inflation target and the strategy review in the sense that we know where we want to end up, more or less. There's a growing, I think, acknowledgement of the fact that the ECB has, at the very least in a passive way to take into account all the implications of the of, of uh, climate change and regulation and taxonomies coming and ultimately that this has to set up the right incentives for the banks the corporate sector the households to make the right decision to get there so we are discussing the the transition it's going to be very difficult but i personally have absolutely no doubt that uh, the ecb is going to have a more active role and the question is how so indeed if you start by tactically uh, pushing uh, for green QE and the Bundesbank uh, rejects that, but we end up with green TLT or maybe that's, uh, that's good enough. But even with green TLT I think the idea is really to uh, start from the, from, the, from the idea that the incentives need to be put in place today for the banks and the corporate sector. That's a question we had in the, in the Q&A from Shaheen Valley, which is very, very relevant. Uh, we are talking about the banks but it's all about the corporate sector and the households ultimately. I mean, the banks should only be 
the transmission channel to, to from, from monetary policy. So ultimately, those goals, those uh, uh, standards need to be put in place by all the corporates for the banks to make it as, for, to make it actually easier for the banks to report and documentate and, and document on the on the on the loans they have. And we, we were going to get there. So with the strategy reviews, also the, the same idea, you want to anchor expectations of the right outcome in the future, unfortunately, in the very long term future, uh, in terms of, infl of the inflation target, for uh, the objective to be credible today, for the right incentives to be in place, and ultimately for this effect to be to be uh, to materialize. The last thing I, I mentioned also uh, listening to Jens and Isabel is that uh, we don't have the numbers exactly, but when Jens mentioned the, the amount of mortgages and the idea of housing bubbles and all the side effects, we're talking about very small numbers today uh, out of the 4.6 trillion of mortgages. Even if you take maybe a, a small fraction of those uh, initially eligible, it's a very small amount that you can use in the pilot program. So again, I think it's the, if there is a decision to make it, the decision is to go with uh, such a, an experiment, I think this tool is probably the, the, the best one, the most uh, um, adequate tool to use. Thanks a lot for that. And just to, I mean, just to kind of touch on the last point again, I mean, to, I think my reading of Weidman's remarks as well was that, you know, this is more not something that he's completely opposed to, that it's more a sense that this is an issue where politicians and you know, Brussels has to lead the way, which is, the, I mean, I think the play, paper gives a flavour of, I mean, there's a lot of emphasis placed on the tax on me, really. So I don't think his views are as diametrically opposed to those of positive money as, as they may be on other issues. Anyway, yeah. Um. What, what's the question exactly? I mean, so, yeah, sorry. I mean, just, just on that, just on that, I mean, I guess it's on the, I mean, it, it, it's for you and Isabel too, I guess about, I mean, to what extent does, does this really make the ECB more or less likely to hit its inflation target? Yeah. Um, so, okay, look, I'm, I, I think nobody has accurately predicted the development of inflation uh, over the coming years, right? It's just something we don't we don't really know. Um, but I also think, look, let's let's take a step back from the idea that inflation is just consumer prices uh, over uh, a two three year time horizon, right? I really think price stability also involves offsetting these shocks that. Uh, Isabel already described, right? So making sure that the EU economy develops in a stable way over time, not hit by um, uh, demand shocks um, from uh, excessive money creation, but also supply shocks from a transition where you suddenly need to stop doing all sorts of things because they're just absolutely incompatible with your environmental uh, objectives. So what, what I hope is that also in the context of, of the current review, given that this is the part of the task of the ECB, there is some um, broader discussion of what do we really want to achieve as, as, as a central bank, right? So on the one hand, or as in a bit like already said about giving up the idea that there's really one instrument, one interest rate, you differentiate that, also maybe differentiate a bit more what, what price stability really means and what what sort of lending really contributes to uh, price stability understood in that way. Now, that of course makes central banking more political, then suddenly you're making uh, choices about the allocation of capital in the economy. So there I think it's really important that there is the green taxonomy, but I, as you said, right, I think it sort of answers it question. It is a real democratic answer to where you want the uh, long-term trajectory of the, the economy to go. Um, and then I think uh, what would be really desirable is to have more detailed uh, taxonomies, uh, also have a list of activities that you really don't want, right? I think that's, I mean, that's a recurring theme, but that would really, I think, help both on the supervision side, but also on the monetary policy side to say like, look, that's, that's really part of our objectives to put the ECB, to, to put the EU economy on a trajectory that doesn't have those kinds of uh, activities. Isabel? 
And so I think there's two debates here on the impact uh, of, of climate change, let's say, and of inflation, and then, of course, the impact that the green tail trolls may have on, on inflation. So on impact of climate change on inflation, I think there's very little studies, and the few that, uh, that exist out there either show a small impact or it goes in different directions depending on you know how policies are also implemented right so it, it's you know if you implement a carbon tax right that would at least in induce some price level shift we may be happy with that currently given our low inflation environment other of course policy may end up being more deflationary so it's very difficult to extend pin down what's the impact of climate change on inflation it, it will depend on, on how policies are implemented on the green culture itself i mean the way i read the proposal i mean it was my personal read that it was falling more into the catalytic role of the ECB, so really supporting the secondary objectives. And then, of course, you know, the main question is whether it jeopardizes or not the price stability objective, right? So, and that's why I kind of say if it doesn't cannibalize the, the general Teltros, if it's a small program, then of course um, it's kind of secondary, then um, whether it adds more to price stability or not. I think the probability, if it's a small program, it, you know, we hope that we uh, achieve also to our general Teltros, uh, you know, price stability and we achieve our, our, um, our aim easier. But I think here on this this proposal, I saw it really something more as as falling under the the secondary objectives. But maybe Jens can can contradict me there if he saw it differently and and how it was read in the end. Yeah. No, I think that's correct with regard to the current uh, definition of price stability in terms of two percent target. I mean, there I think it's difficult to make a really strong case either way that it will really benefit achieving that target or or hinder that target but that that definition is from 2003 it's not been updated for uh, over 15 years it's something that that the ecb has set and and i think it should be be revised more critically and i think if you do that then um you'll see that these that there are these deflationary inflationary shocks and then might be right okay climate change transition is going to cause a deflationary shock and an uh, uh, inflationary shock and then uh, overall we're still at two percent but I, I think then you would hit the current inflation under, under the current definition but that might suggest that that this definition is not uh, accurate and I've got a question for for Frederick I mean to what when you're talking to clients um, uh, what, what's, what's their sense on how, how green the ECB should be and just in general, how much demand is there for green assets, whether those assets be in the form of debt or equity? There is, uh, as you can imagine, a huge demand for ESG assets and all the, the, the new asset classes, uh, not that new, but how we touched upon at the beginning, the need for very uh, acceptable, harmonized uh, taxonomy and criteria, which is not the case when you look at uh, rating agencies and we are only at the beginning of the process. So the focus is really on, on that. No one really cares about Teltros, I have to say, uh, which is a pity, but that's the case, which is also the reason why, I mean, again, um, not only have they been effective, in my opinion, but in the future, in a normal life, when we go over, we, we get over this pandemic, the, the slack we have, the discussion and questions we have about inflation, if we ever come back to a normal life, then Teltros should be part of the normal toolkit of the ECB. So if you um, forget for a moment about uh, uh, 3 trillion excess liquidity, 2.56 trillion uh, asset purchases, and we get back to a, a situation where the ECB is actually steers short-term interest rates in a more effective and fine-tuned way, then that's where uh, any green teltro would have a disproportionately, I might say, outsized effect on the economy and ultimately on the transmission of monetary policy to a sustainable economy. That's, that's really the framework maybe that in which we, we should think about that. Small numbers today, potentially growing quite significantly in the future and in a situation where uh, we, well, I don't think we get back to a normal balance sheet ever, but if we get something with more manageable and less of a, a, a day-to-day -day focus on, on asset purchases, then uh, it's again a situation where, when greening the, the monetary policy would come through collateral and refinancing operation, which I, I think would be the most desirable option uh, to me, also the most acceptable one uh, uh, on the governing council. Thanks a lot for that. Well, we're, late, we're, we're more or less, well, we're out of time now, but before, before we go, I just would like to ask all of you to, to give me the sort of like, the one key takeaway that you've taken from, from the discussion and the kind of like 
the imprint you'd like to make on on the viewers which uh, despite what you say frederick we've still got an awful lot of people tuning in so there are some people interested in teltros out there other than the 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 four of us um so if if i begin with with Fred, then to Isabel, and then Jens to, to give you the final word, then I think that would be great. Fred, if you want to fire away. Again, very briefly, I mean, Teltros are great. Flexible tools should be kept as a structural part of the toolkit. And Green Teltro, if the ECB decided to go into a more active role uh, in this uh, recovery and path to a more sustainable economy, should be, to me, the, the, the best suited tool uh, to be used in the future. Isabel? Okay, so um, great proposal. Um, general takeaway that I would like to, uh, you know, have you go uh, home with, or you know, at least stay at home and switch off the WebEx, is uh, you know, ECB is very much engaged into this debate. We're very willing uh, to look at proposals. Um, at the same time, we want to do things well. So you know, that means that we also need to look at all the pros and cons, and, and you know, give us some time. Thanks. Yeah, I, I just want to thank everybody for all the uh, input. I mean, I want to emphasize, look, I certainly don't really know how this program should develop in the coming years. I think that's something uh, to see. And I, I also particularly look forward what the ECB might uh, put, put forward in terms of thinking on, on how to actually uh, do this. So thanks a lot to all the panelists today and thanks a lot for tuning in. I think it's been a really useful discussion and um, I hope you found it equally enjoyable and um, you've learned a lot about not only green teltros, but about the ECB's viewpoint, about some of the information problems, um, you know, about some of the perverse incentives. So, I mean, there's, there's an awful lot that came under discussion, but really an awful lot of insight too. So I'm just going to hand the floor to Stan to give us the final word. Um, but yeah, thanks a lot. Cheers. Thank you, Claire. And this just to really thank you, everyone, all the panelists for the great discussion. Thank you, Claire, for moderating. Thank you, all the attendees. I, it's the first, actually, the first webinar we're organizing. So my team was a bit under stress the, the last few days, but it all went well. We had many, many people, much more than we anticipated. So that's really encouraging for us. I would also say, echoing what Jan said earlier, I think. It's certainly true that for the last few years, we've seen the central bank community in Europe changing a lot in how they interact um, with people, with civil society, organizations in general, including us. And it, it's really a positive move. And as has been said, this is just the, the start for us uh, of uh, campaigning on this proposal. And we look forward for more engagement uh, with the central bank community in Europe, because ultimately we, we need to kind of co-create uh, this, uh, this, this, the solution for the climate um, crisis. And uh, we will play a part on, on our side. Thank you again, everyone, and, and have a great day. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thank you.